uh, I want to make sure we cover policy development. And Amy, I have a question for you. So the FDA has issued guidance to support development of cell and gene therapy products. Obviously, there's guidance development based on commitments under PDUVA 7 and CBER guidance agenda. So I'd love to know, you know, what are you looking forward to and what are your thoughts on how to best approach and support policy development in the in the field? Great, thank you, Erin. Um, my immediate role has been on regulatory policy. So I, I really appreciate the question. I, I may have too much to say on this, so I, I'll try and curtail my thoughts on, on the key points in your question. Um, one thing I will say before I take the deep dive into um, what we're looking for policy development and PDUFA 7 and CBER guidance agenda and beyond um, is you know supporting the development with resources for CBER. That was one of the biggest things that came out of PDUFA 7 where um, the cell and gene therapy program at FDA is augmented with additional resources more than ever in the history of all PDUFA reauthorizations, um, giving resources to CBER to ensure that they have what they need to sustain and expand the program. Um, and support development in the field with uh, a staggering number of development and INDs that they're managing. Um, and that also involves policy development, public-private partnerships, education in the public forum. And so I, I really think that providing CBER the resources via PDUFA 7 and, and other venues has, has been key to support um, all things that CBER does, including policy development in the field. There's a lot in PDUFA 7 specific to cell and gene therapies, um, which is very promising um, and that we've been looking out for. And you know, in PDUFA 7, uh, for folks who may not be familiar with, with what the commitment letter entails, there are general PDUFA-related commitments with a, which apply to all PDUFA products, including cell and gene therapy products, but also other biologics and small products that all come under the PDUFA umbrella, which, and those general commitments also would impact cell and gene therapies. Um, as, as being a PDUFA product or, or more so um, given at the cutting, cutting edge advanced therapy stage they are. And then there is a dedicated CBER section, which includes cell and gene therapy specific commitments related to policy development that, that we've been on, you know, watching um, develop. Um, speaking of the general ones, I, I won't belabor the point and include everything, but as an example, interact meetings, which are, which were a CBER specific non PDUFA informal meeting for super early stage pre pre IND stage development are now under the PDUFA umbrella in PDUFA seven. Um, there's a new type D meeting type. Um, there used to be type ABC meetings earlier. Now there is the new interact meeting under PDUFA and the type D meeting under PDUFA. Um, for example, at the FDA workshop on potency um, held in June, um, FDA leadership Denise Gavin in her presentation noted that sponsors could use the new type D meeting for potency discussions, for example, because there's there are intended to be meetings um, that are a little bit faster turnaround than than other meeting types and to a topic and in, in one or two disciplines. There is also a new follow up opportunity under PDUFA 7. There are commitments related to rare diseases that apply uniquely to cell and gene therapy products because a lot of the product development is for rare diseases, including a new uh, rare disease endpoint advancement pilot. Um, there are CMC readiness related pilot and, and commitments that would apply uh, a lot heavily to cell and gene therapy products. There are drug safety modernization tool related people for seven commitments that would apply to cell and gene therapy products, especially in the post approval stage for long-term follow-up of these products after administered. And those are some of the general ones that apply uniquely um, in the policy development arena for topics that we're looking out for. Now, specific to CBER related PDUFA 7 commitments, they, they committed to certain set of guidances and certain set of workshops that eventually lead to policy development. Um, you know, they were committed to hold a PFDD workshop, which they've already held last fall, and a report which was recently issued. So that's that's great development. And the report as under PDUFA 7 commitment looks at uh, tools and methods to use and capture patient experience data, of, you know, the needs of the community to ensure how these uh, tools and methods to capture patient experience and patient preference data um, are leveraged and informed regulatory decision making. 
um, they were committed to a workshop on uh, post-approval safety and efficacy data collection for cell and gene therapy products, which was held in April. And now we're looking, waiting for the summary report um, from that workshop that is also a Purdue for Seven commitment. And a nice segment to guidance is, because the workshop and the report will then inform FDA's guidance on that topic on methods and approaches, including use of real world evidence in registries for capturing post-approval data. FDA is also committed to issue draft guidance on evaluation of efficacy in small patient populations using novel trial designs and statistical methods and how these concepts can then be applied to more common diseases. That would be a nice one to look out for. The one that I'm perhaps most excited about is the Q&A guidance that FDA is committed under Purdue for Seven based on frequently asked questions and commonly faced issues identified by sponsors or by public-private partnerships. For this Q&A guidance, I'm, I, I hope and I've voiced this thought in, in other forums, is that FDA takes an iterative approach to the Q&A guidance. You know, they, they've taken this approach in the past. For example, the Q&A for biosimilars development um, about a decade back. Um, and also more recently, the, the Q&A on clinical trial conduct during COVID, uh, FDA adopted the iterative approach for those two Q&A guidances where, you know, an initial set of draft Q&As is issued, some of them are finalized, more Q&As are added in draft as more issues are identified or surface. And you know that approach worked really well it, as opposed to waiting for a huge guidance move through the agency's clearance engine, which I've, I've worked for the agency and been on the other side of the table, it does take a long time. So you know, piecemealing that would, would be really exciting. Another guidance FDA is updating is the guidance on um, RMAT program, the, the RMAT designation program, and, and specifically under Purdue for Seven, they are committed to add additional thinking on post-approval requirements, including use of real-world evidence to confirm clinical benefit uh, for products approved under accelerated approval and other thoughts on safety monitoring and long-term follow-up. That would be a good one to look out for. Um, they may also look at um, including recommendations related to CMC for RMAT designated products. Um, and and lastly, FDA is also committed to convene a public meeting uh, with manufacturers on how sponsors may leverage internal prior knowledge and public knowledge. And, and that's really key to continue to build on, on, on prior knowledge versus reinventing the wheel or repeating studies. That, that's all. Um, but outside Purdue for Seven, a Fedora commitment under the omnibus just, just passed last December, uh, FDA is committed to issue a guidance on platform technology. Now, this is a general guidance, not limited to cell and gene therapy products, but there's so much there, hopefully, for cell and gene therapy products under the platform approach. And outside of um, man mandated guidance under Purdue for Seven and Omnibus, Eber issued their guidance. They issue their guidance agenda twice a year. The most recent one issued in June of 2023 notes a guidance on potency. Hey, that would be exciting. Hopefully, it, 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 I expect it to build on the potency meeting last year and workshop this year and now followed by a guidance. Another guidance on voluntary consensus standards recognition program for cell and gene therapy products. Big key one to watch out for, hopefully helps streamline development. Um, we also mentioned comparability, which was issued in July. Um, and other guidances, um, for example, on safety testing for human allogeneic cells expanded for use in cell-based medical products. Um, there's also a guidance expected on considerations for use of human and animal derived materials and components in the manufacture of cell and gene therapy as well as tissue engineered products. Really, uh, a lot is happening on the policy development space and, you know, this is just some things that we're looking at.